uh, just to investigate Georgia. I don't know if you can read these things, but uh, my early years in Wisconsin, uh, my, uh, my tenure talk was mostly sort of on this early stuff, organic clean chemistry mostly. I was kind of, uh, let's say, synthetic methods with an interest in physical organic, and slowly sort of migrated to being a physical organic chemist with an interest in synthetic chemistry, but I've always sort of been on that, on that borderline. Um, and you can see that uh, after a while there's some silicon stuff here. And I'm going to start with that in terms of silicon period here, where I had several people doing uh, plastic ketone chemistry. And uh, then I got into lithium radiation stuff. And I thought I would just give you a, a, a quick uh, look at, at uh, you know, how I, why I made that transition and, and what got me interested in this topic uh, as a, as a, uh, as a uh, research enterprise rather than just the utility. So we were doing acetyl ketone chemistry, and uh, one of my students, Rick Olson, had uh, discovered this really interesting transformation, I think, uh, and a number, a number of others that are quite related. In other words, if you add a lithium acetylide to this acetyl ketone, you get a normal ignition product. And uh, this then does a rearrangement uh, where the silicon migrates from carbon to oxygen. This is known as a truck rearrangement, and it is driven by the fact that the oxygen silicon bonds are almost twice as strong as carbon silicon bonds. And so there's a big driving force for silicon to migrate. And it means that you can take an alkoxide, which is a relatively non-basic uh, system, uh, and make a carbanion out of it. And you can, and Rick found that you can actually use this carbanion for synthetic reaction. For example, uh, if you throw methyl iodide into this mix, uh, you get this amino phthalene. So this is pretty interesting and maybe even useful, uh, because this is a kind of enol that you can't make directly. In other words, if, this, if you take a ketone like this, you can do kinetic enolization to make this enolase, or you can do thermodynamic enolization to make this one, but there isn't any way to enolize that one that goes directly from that structure. Now, it's not that we can't do that sort of thing, but we can't do it by direct enolization, because there's no way to preferentially remove that proton to make this enolase up here. And here we have a way of making this compound, and includes formation of two carbon compounds. Now, notice it's a little bit complicated here. We do the first reaction in ether and the second reaction in THF. And the reason for that is that if you don't do that, you don't get any product. Uh, it has to be done that way. And it's not, not surprising, I think, here. Uh, remember, what we're doing is we're adding a lithium reagent to a ketone. And in the same pot, we're making a new lithium reagent, which can also react with the ketone uh, if things aren't done quite right. And it turns out, in ether, this book arrangement is very unfavorable, and so you can do the addition and get mostly this stuff. And when you add THF, this equilibration becomes uh, faster and uh, more thermodynamically favorable, and then you can do the second step of the So this is all fine good. Uh, Rick ran uh, uh, 10 or 15 examples of this reaction. Uh, we can change the lithium rate, we can change the R group, different style groups, different alkaline here, that's actually more a very general reaction. So, uh, you know, I had actually written a paper, I talked about it at a conference. And uh, I said, Rick, you know, before we publish this thing, it's customary for these synthetic methods papers to run a sort of a scale reaction. You know, 30 millimoles, you know, make a few milliliters of the compound instead of a smidge on the bottom of the, of the flask. So we went out and, you know, prepared the starting materials, uh, ran the reaction, came back sort of a week later looking pretty haggard and saying, you know, the reaction doesn't work. I said, I mean, it doesn't scale up. You know, we have to figure out how to scale this thing up. He said, no, it doesn't work anymore at any scale. It stopped working once again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this was, this was halfway through a PhD thesis. Uh, he's, up, he's upset. Of course, I'm also upset not as much as he is at this point. <laughs> but, you know, we faced the prospect of having done this whole thing because we couldn't make the reaction work anymore. Well, thanks to his good record keeping, we eventually figured out what had gone wrong with this process. And uh, this is kind of interesting. So, uh, the, the protonation of the acetylene was done with lithium isopropyl amide. And at that time, I had a group of people all using these kinds of bases. So we used to make up two liters of lithium isopropyl amide every two weeks or so, and, and use it up and go through the process for every month or so, however long it took. And of course, LDA is usually made by deprotonating that isopropyl amine with the lithium, which is sort of cheap. Now, it turns out that we had run out of the lithium, and one of the students, not Rick, but another one, had to use. Uh, had used methyl lithium to do the deprotonation uh, to make the LDA. It didn't make any difference, but it turns out that was the key because the methyl lithium you used had lithium bromide in it. So if you made methyl lithium from, from, from methyl chloride, the lithium chloride precipitates out and you get what's called bromoaline methyl lithium. If you make it from lithium bromide, the lithium bromide stays in solution and you get high 
like this. That was one of the living Roma. It turns out this was the secret. If you did not have the living Roma in here, this reaction totally failed. Uh, I mean, we're not, we're not talking about OEMs, we're talking about no detectable product. You know, stuff really goes wrong without the living Roma. And I said to myself, you know, this is actually pretty interesting. There must be some all sorts of interesting chemistry going on here, and it wouldn't be nice if somebody figured out what happens in these sorts of um, reactions. And it turns out that although lithium reagents have already for, you know, a century almost, been, been used by standard chemists productively, there was relatively little known about how these things actually work, uh, the structures were to some extent known, but uh, their activity was pretty tough. And one of the reasons is that lithium reagents are very, very reactive, and it's not easy to do kinetic studies. In other words, uh, get a little oxygen in there, the lipid reacts with it maybe it makes some oxide, the oxides interfere with the kinetics, and you get all these sorts of problems. Not to mention the fact that any of these reactions are very, very fast, and uh, you can't do ordinary kinetics to study a reaction of a lipid patient with an L-lag or keto because the reaction is over in microseconds, okay? It's simply difficult to, to do this sort of thing. But anyway, so I thought this would be interesting. And if you go to the literature, you can find you know, many examples of, of funny things. <laughs> I mean, just, just to finish my story here, um, although we studied many looking reactions in subsequent years, we never did figure out what's actually going on here, except that we have to have a little robot to make the reaction. Uh, somehow the living bromide plays a role in interfering, I think, with the, with the business of this equilibration versus the, addition, the initial ketone. There's some balance of activity there that is profoundly affected by this. Anyway, we don't know. So there's lots of examples of this sort of stuff. Um, Here's just a few that I probably have a hundred of these examples that I've collected over the years, where small changes in solvent or additives or some, some feature causes dramatic changes in the way these things behave. Uh, so for example, here's one that I did in Franklin, Ohio State. Uh, if you treat uh, this, uh, this styrenal tin compound with, with uh, pico lithium and hexane, you get addition to the double bond. And you get kind of a microphyte addition, I suppose, to the double bond and get this reagent. If you do the same reaction with THF, uh, the lithium attacks the tin, you get a tin exchange, and you make this lithium reaction. This is clean, so it's one way or the other. They didn't give real numbers, but it, it just uh, completes it. And there's lots of stereochemical effects of this type. Uh, here's a sort of asymmetric synthesis with a, with a chiral auxiliary. Uh, ventilation of this kind of inlaid structure uh, gives uh, one stereoisomer in THF if you add HMPA. And I don't have the structure of HMPA here, but you will see a lot more about HMPA later. Uh, the stereochemistry flips completely from you know 20 to 1 one way to 21 to the other way. Nice, nice result for asymmetric synthesis because that's that's often you know troublesome to get that thing. And here's another one where the, where the stereochemistry uh, flips completely between when an enolate reacts with an epoxide versus reacting with an iodide. Uh, and uh, lots more I can go on and on. Here's another one where uh, in hexane, butylithium adds to the carbonyl group, uh, whereas in, uh, um, in uh, sort of more polar solvent, the, the uh, butylithium adds to the tin compound, you get this lithium reagent, it cyclizes to get this type of butane. So it's a big flip uh, in reactivity. Here's a methylation site. Depending on the solvent polarity, you can either methylate the methyl group here or um, methylate this CH here and get uh, two different lithium reagents. Uh, obviously, useful if you want to do that sort of thing. And then uh, more retro chemistry issues. Uh, Kudik uh, reported that in ether, uh, this reagent adds in a conjugate fashion to give almost entirely the 1 4 adduct, so in addition to the double bond here, whereas in THF, it kills almost entirely to the carbonyl group. And we have also studied this reaction at some length. I won't talk about that this time. But uh, another situation where, again, in ether, now we get the opposite effect. In ether, we get the one-two addition. In THF, we get a mix. If we add HMPA, we get all of the, uh, the other products. So that, that's, these, are, these are mysteries. Uh, you know, we've sort of gone through and addressed uh, various ones of these over here. So why is this? Well, lithium reagents are complicated structures in solution. Uh, depending on what the R group is here, these things can exist either as tetramers, and occasionally as trimers, sometimes as dimers. They can exist as monomers, the way we usually write them. Um, there's also other species, for example, triple ions show up in these uh, reaction mixtures very often. And then you can break the carbon lithium bond and make separated ion pairs, or you can let the R and the lithium fall apart entirely, which is actually quite rare for these kinds of reagents. And make what are called separate lines. So you have a total gamma reaction. 
So in any one reaction, you may have several of these species present, and you might have several of them doing chemistry. And as the reaction proceeds, of course, you always have another illicit species present. You start to get mixed aggregates, so you replace one of these R groups by a product, or more of these R groups by a product. So as the reaction proceeds, you end up having six or seven different reactions going on at the same time. So this is why people have shy away from trying to figure out what's going on in these reactions, because it's tough. And uh, you know, the literature is full of people adding stuff to these solutions because these additives make changes in how things behave, as I've just shown you. So here's just a couple of the common additives. Here's HMPA, I'll we'll talk a lot about that. One can consider THF as a salt, sort of an additive. In fact, it can be used as an additive sometimes. It's effective to so large that even one equivalent will sometimes make a big difference. PMDA is a very common one. And then there's lots of others that are you know, polyvented ligands of various types, uh, all of which uh, have some effect on both the reactivity of these species and on which species might be predominant in a given solution. Okay, so getting back to the silo-ketone question and the, the, uh, the uh, intermediate allele uh, for carbon lithium that I drew there, uh, we decided to take a look at, at, uh, at what these species provide in solution. It wasn't known really whether uh, these kinds of reagents had the partial. <laughs> I see I've got the names confused, but I'm sorry about that. Um, this is the alenal lithium, this is the propartial lithium. Um, but the, it wasn't even known where the lithium spent its time or whether it was some kind of rich species, whether it was just a single structure present. And so we thought we'd do a very simple experiment. We would take a uh, partial pin and do a lithium pin exchange on this compound. If we're lucky, we'll make one of these reagents. And if we take the corresponding legal isomer, we'll just migrate it in the other side and do the same reaction on that, uh, we might make the other isomer. We don't know which one we'll get, but we might say we'll get one or the other. And what we're simply going to do is compare the chemistry of these two. And, and sure enough, if you take the recordial pin compound, uh, treat it with trimethyl chloride as a, as a captured reagent, and then add enough lipids to that mixture. This is what we call the in situ experiment, where the electrophile is present while the lipidation is being formed. Uh, in fact, you do get, uh, from, from this uh, reaction, you get mostly the propartial product, 95 to 5. If you use the illegal starting material and do the same experiment, uh, you get mostly the illegal product. You said, oh, isn't that neat? Uh, we're doing something specific here. Um, and if we, if we do the opposite mode of addition, in other words, if we first make the lithium reagent by doing an exchange, and then add trimethyl chloride, it doesn't matter which one we use, we always get only the, the uh, uh, partial type product. And so this is, this is, this is neat. So what is this cool? We've made several lithium reagents, we've captured them. Now, you might say, well, uh, what's really going on here? Um, there are 32 species present. One we might call one the stable species. This is the one that's formed if you if you add that lithium, make the lithium rage, let it sit for even a few seconds, and then you do chemistry from it. It doesn't matter where it came from, it always gives the same product. This we call the stable product, the stable intermediate. But in here, when we make the lithium rage in the presence of the electrophile, uh, there is a transient species which gives the other product. The question is, what are these two species? For the stable species, we're pretty happy with the partial lithium because uh, we recognized uh, that this was the same structure, as I'll show you in just a second. And it makes a certain amount of sense if you, if you re remember that these kinds of uh, species, uh, allyl or allyl or propargyl, have a strong tendency to react with electrophiles at the other end. This is the so-called SE2 prime uh, substitution. And that is probably because an electrophile, rather than tangling with the carbon metal bond here, would rather react with the electron-rich pyrrole at the other end, and so you get uh, this kind of process with this end attached to the electrophile and not the uh, carbon metal bond. And, and this, this is not universal, but in, in many electrophilic substitutions of this type, the boron compounds can link other metal, uh, you get this kind of, of uh, SE2 prime process. And so we sort of imagine that uh, when, we, uh, when we did the exchange here, uh, we got the illegal product from, from the partial starting material and the partial electric particles. And so everything looks like this. So what are these structures in solution? Well, it turns out that both illegal lithiums uh, are in fact have the illegal structure. In other words, the lithium is not only bounded to one end of it. And we show this by many, many of our studies of these sorts of species. Here is illegal lithium itself. The key chemical shift here, this is E13 chemical shift. 
is the essential carbon at 191 parts per million, that's an allele carbon, and the acetylene carbon would show 100 parts per million on field carbon at 80 or 90 parts per million, something like that. So very, very clear, uh, we're, we're very fortunate here to have a very clear indication of the structure. There are two species present, this, these can clearly be shown to be the monomer species and the dimer species by looking at the carbon lithium bond. Now lithium is an NMR active isotope, it has a spin of three halves, so when something couples to lithium, it doesn't get a doublet, it gives a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one quartet, as you can see here. So this is a carbon bonded to two to one lithium, but the second species present has a septet, and that is the result of a carbon coupled to two lithium. Just so we know uh, that is the doctor. So two species of one and dimer. When you start adding alkyl groups here, as in the system that I had before, the dimer pretty much goes away and we get all monomers. So the stable species is an illegal lithium in, in this case. They're not all like that. If you do certain structural features, you can make them to go to the to the partial end. So for example, cyclopropane here introduces what's called high strain at that carbon. In other words, that carbon is trying to be 100, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's trying to be 120 degrees, it's forced down to 60, and uh, it's it's pretty unhappy at, at uh, when the lithium is at the other end. It's a uh, more stable situation here. So these are these are the partial lithium. And you can see they have a shift here. R, characteristic of acetylene, not of a monomaly. If you have a strong chelating group like this uh, carbamyl system, you also move the lithium to this end. And if you have an anti-stabilizing group, that also has the same effect. So phenothiol or phenol has that effect. Uh, then you have species that seem to be in between, which are in fact in some cases a mixture of the two isomers. And in some cases, they're actually just a bridge structure. So we were able to identify these structures also from more sophisticated NMR experiments, which uh, uh, Jennifer Shoemaker will tell some of you about next semester, perhaps the, uh, the uh, um, uh, isotope perturbation type experiments. But for simple alkyl uh, systems, they are all exclusively on the on the uh, uh, Okay, so uh, back to our problem here. Um, we did, uh, we began to do experiments uh, changing everything you can think of in the system because we want to be sure we're right about our identification. And one experiment we did was to run the same reaction, exactly the same reaction, except with some HMPA present. Now, HMPA's uh, main feature is a, a, a very strong donor ability. It is a much stronger donor, for example, than THF or almost any other component that you can name. So it has a very profound effect on lithium radiation structure, as we'll show you later. But anyway, if you do this reaction in terms of HMPA, all of a sudden it turns out that no matter which one of these starting materials you use, you get the same result. In other words, it no longer depends on what you start with, but you still get two different products depending on how you do the reaction. If you do the in situ experiment where the TMS chloride is present at the birth of the reagent, uh, you get uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, legal product. If you make the liquid reagent and add TMS chloride, you get the partial product. But the, 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 the idea that our two species are those two is no longer tenable because now there has to be something else. So maybe the stable structure is the partial lithium, but the transient structure cannot be an illegal lithium. So uh, here's, here's basically the scheme that we're, that we're dealing with. The methyl lithium gives the transient structure, which when it is captured directly, gives the illegal product. Uh, if there's any time at all, or if you start with this stuff, you tend to get the stable structure, which when it gets captured, uh, gets the partial product. So the question is, uh, we're pretty comfortable with the stable structure being the legal lithium. Uh, what's the transient structure? And so here are some of the possibilities we went through. Uh, we changed the pin group, we changed solvents, uh, we changed the concentration, we fooled with the lithium reagent, uh, we fooled with the cracking agent, we did whatever we did. And uh, uh, not, nothing really worked out here except for one possibility, and that was something that probably took me a year and a half to actually consider. Uh, that the transient species was the separated hydrogen. Now these, these species, if their stable structure is contact, in other words, the lithium is on the carbon, firmly bound there, and in fact, HMPA cannot pull that lithium off, so it is on there uh, uh, for good. But uh, here's the mechanism we ended up with, which really explains all of our experiments. We literally did hundreds and hundreds of these experiments, because I got kind of crazy about this, because, you know, <laughs> it's one of these things that you say, there has to be an explanation. No, clear scientists. Everything has a lot of explanation, right? Um, and this is what we came up with, which fits all of our data. And this is as follows. So uh, when you do this exchange reaction, methyl lithium adds to the thin compound, 
and you get an intermediate, the so-called A complex. This is a kid which has five fruit flies and uh, species. This, these two A complexes we were able to characterize microscopically. You can see these in some cases, not in this one, but with other groups on here, these, these become big. Now, this thing uh, can decompose to the lithic range in two ways. Uh, it can simply leave the carbon in that, in which case, what you first form is a separate line pair. Because in this species, the lithium is uncoordinated, though it's going to be fully solvated. A lithium with four solvent is not an electrophile. You have to first pull out one of the solvents before you can do anything with the lithium. And so as it's born, uh, you get a separated ion pair, but of course those solvents are always coming out of all, and the thing will then collapse to the contact ion pair, which is much more structured. But if there's an electrophile present in solution, you can capture this thing, and this thing reacts exclusively at the, at the uh, allele end of the system. In other words, this is where most of the charge is, and this is where this thing reacts. But the stable structure reacts in the way characteristic of, of, uh, of other allele systems, and that is when it reacts with an with electrophile, it reacts at the other end here to give this one. So this is our explanation, and uh, this basically covers uh, uh, it nicely rationalized everything that, uh, that we found out uh, about, about the system. So this, goes, this, this shows that the, that the reactivity of the species is so high that it will, it will do an instant substitution on the silicon faster than a solvent can come off the lithium and pop down on the species. That has to be the case here. And uh, believe me, when I, when I tried to publish this paper, people gave me a hard time about this. Everybody thought that the contact separate ion pair it equilibrates so fast that nothing else is happening. Well, here's evidence that that's not the case. Okay. Uh, so HNK. Uh, HNK played a big role in this because it allowed us to kind of create different situations for the for the cattle. And so I might point out that the reason HNK is so different, and that is when HNK is a solvent here, this thing becomes much longer lived because it's much harder to pull an HNK off of it than it is to pull a THN off. And so that gives time, no matter what, how you start here, everything equilibrates to the stable A complex, which when it leaves is that So that's why H and K has that effect. Okay, so, so we, we have, you know, a lot of these effects. And the question is, what does H and K do to these structures exactly? And here, here we've got one. And this is a, this is a, a, a research area that I'm not going to talk very much about. Uh, and this is this, this uh, exchange reaction. I talked about the Kim exchange. These exchange reactions work well. Bromine, some iodine, some tellurium, some selenium, you know, lots of other elements, but uh, those are the most commonly used by chemists. And uh, we show pretty clearly that all of these, uh, these uh, changes involve a complex intermediate. In other words, where the, where the lithium rate that's doing the exchange adds to the intermediate structure, you have a stable species that exists for some time, and then the other one comes along and you get your lithium range. Okay, so this is the a complex mechanism. <coughs> So here's an illustration of, uh, of that. If you take phenyl lithium, and uh, li these are lithium in R spectra, uh, phenyl lithium dimer and monomer, two pieces here. Uh, if you start adding an outer benzene to that mixture, you get a new species, which is wrong because it's exchanging the thing. But eventually, by the time you add one equivalent of outer benzene, uh, you get a brand new species, a sharp singlet, which is simply lithium with four THN bonds. And of course, the counter ion is this diphenyl ion in A complex. So, this is kind of the first proof that these species don't just exist as intermediates, but they actually form this significant amount. And this raised the interesting questions do these have useful chemistry impacts? These things do different reactions. We didn't find much there, but uh, that's not the point. So, we did the same experiment with HNPA. Um, we got the same result. In other words, here's the lithium rate in the absence of HNPA. And uh, as we add, now, the bend thing to this, we get the same species, but this thing is not a sink, but this thing is a nice pentec. Why is it a pentec? Well, now we have four HNPAs around it. Phosphorus is an NMR activator, so it's a spin one half, just like protons, and so we see a coupling between lithium and phosphorus, and that's where we get the pentec. So we know, you know, really for the first time, what the solvation state of this particular lithium is. This has four HNPAs around it. And if it has only three, we would get a quartet. If it has two, we get a triplet, and so on. And, so, and I thought, well, this is interesting because it's always been the big mystery here about the solvation effect. At least with HMPA, you can tell what the solvation state of the lithium is. And, and so on. 
So here's the phosphorus in the heart spectrum, 3HMK, and here's the phosphorus coupled to lithium. It's a one-to-one -one triplet, the quartet, as I said, uh, from the same atoms. So here's just a reiteration of this whole business. Very kind of properties, so I won't spend much uh, time on. But uh, the effect of HMK is, uh, is the following thing. It's going to reduce the level of aggregation because, uh, as I was uh, pointed out in the earlier slide, but uh, uh, the more you solvate the list, the less opportunity it is to form these aggregates. Because the reason these things aggregate is because the carbon carbon is very unhappy and it seeks other lithium, and the lithium is unhappy, it seeks other carbon. So that would happen. Um, the uh, the uh, uh, monomeric species are usually more reactive than the dimeric and pentameric species, and I'll show you just how much in a minute. And uh, we are also going to make the lithium catalyte a less electric, elect, uh, a less strong blue acid. So the catalysis by lithium will go down, the reactivity of the carbanion will go up. So here's just an MR spectrum of, uh, say, a separated ion where you have this pentet and uh, a mono HMK complex where the lithium spectrum is just a double because the lithium is now coupled only to one phosphorus. So we've looked at many of these. Uh, these are we call these HMK titrations. Uh, we have probably done 100 of these, so we know what this looks like for every lithium agent you can think of. Um, and uh, we like these sulfur silicon stabilized ones, and they shift to the NMR spectrum. So I thought I'd just show you a couple of these real quick. Here's a separate ion. This species is a separate ion pair in PHF. In other words, the lithium is bonded to carbon. And when you do an HMK titration here, you simply do a sequential solvation. So we have these PHF species, we have these mono HMK complex doubling, we get a triplet, we get a quartet, and then we get the pentet. So this is simply sequential solvation. Perfectly standard, uh, everything is consistent. Here's a, a carbon lithium bond that's a little stronger, and here we actually solvate the contact ion pair. We get a doublet, that's the mono HMK complex, we get a triplet, that's still, that's now this HMK complex, two of these on here. But then we start to get the pentet. And at this point, the carbon lithium bond has been broken. Okay, so now we've gone from a contact ion pair to a separate ion pair. So uh, you know, this is this is unambiguously clear evidence. And this question is always sort of mystified because because it was very difficult to establish when this sort of thing actually happened. Here we can see it uh, very clear. Note that we jumped over one formation space. There's no there's, we have never actually seen three HMPAs on the lithium also bonded to a carbon. I think that just isn't blue. It's just that the HMP is a pretty big sort of ligand and it doesn't happen. So uh, when the when the carbon lithium bond breaks, you suddenly pick up two more HMPAs, and that's always a signature for uh, for a separate document. Uh, we also encountered more complicated species in these titrations, which had been thought about before but hadn't really been detected. And these are called triple ions. So a triple ion. Uh, here's, here's a, a simple one that you can, that you can focus on. The triple ion is a lithium that has a lithium cation sort of outside the sphere and a, a lithium that is bonded to two carbons. So the triple ion comes uh, from ion pair theory way back someplace. It's a stupid name, but uh, it's, what, it's what people use. Uh, so it turns out we had it in any of these solutions, you end up making triple ions. And I think the reason is pretty clear. And that is, uh, the outside lithium can be solvated with four HMPAs. The inside lithium is probably naked, but that's still better than trying to solvate the contact ion pair, where you can only get a, a certain number of HMPAs throughout. So here's a, a system that does this and does a lot of it. Uh, this is this uh, pure little thiol, phenyl thiol, methyl lithium. Um, and uh, these are these are lithium and MR spectra. Uh, in the PHF, you have a singlet. Now, if you put carbon 13 at that carbon, do, it, do a labeling experiment, that goes to a double. That is now coupling between carbon and the lithium, and the carbon 13 also has to fit on that, and also coupled in the same way. You get a doublet. Uh, so we start adding HMK to the solution. We, we get uh, first a doublet. That would be a doublet of doublets in the carbon 13 spectrum. And uh, eventually, uh, we, get, uh, we get to this stage here. Um, the red is the carbon labeled one, the black is the carbon unlabeled one. And you can see uh, this doublet is actually a doublet of doublets. This is a lithium that's coupled both to carbon and phosphorus, perfectly normal sort of NMR analysis. But we also have another species over here, in fact, two species, two singlets show up over here. 
which when you look at the carbon label compounds are both triplets. So these are lithiums that are bonded to two carbons. And that sort of theory identifies this as the triple ion type of structure. Why are there two of them? Well, you can see we have two asymmetric centers here. And so we have a diesel and a diesel. These are two diastereomers, and they're both present in the electron tissue. So these are, these are triple ions, and they show up all the time in these HCT titrations. And what the balloon fails to show up as reactive species sometimes, although uh, that's a little harder to, to establish. Um, uh, as a final thing here, here's the HCA titration of a phenolate. Phenolates are highly aggregated. Oxygen is very unhindered. It's quite basic. And these things tend to aggregate extensively. And most unhindered phenolates are actually catchments. So the question is, what does the HCA species want to be? And the answer is shown here. It simply, it simply bonds to the four quarters of the tetramer, these cubic tetramers. Uh, in sequence, it doesn't do anything else to it. It doesn't take donor, it doesn't take monomer, it simply solvates the tetramer, and the tetramer stays as it is. And you can see that here. These are carbon 13 antibodies back here. Uh, so here's the THS species. You start adding patient K, and you get a 1 to 3 ratio of peaks. That 1 to 3 ratio of peaks is clearly a structure where we have an HSK on one lithium, and the other three lithiums still have THS on, so you get the 1 to 3 ratio of peaks. So uh, just to make an emphasize the point as we stated before, perhaps you've noticed, in order to do these experiments, you really have to go down in temperature, because otherwise the exchange of the HMP is too fast, and you don't see anything at all. It's no useful information. So uh, part of the reason for, for the success of all this is that we have, for many years, had a wonderful low temperature in our spectrometer here, where we could go down to minus 165 degrees. We've had a spectrum of minus 165, although it's a little difficult to find these moments, that we can start with these groups. You will find, uh, I, I've talked to many people who said, well, you know, we, that our, our Charlie Fry doesn't let us go below minus 100 on our spectrometer. I say, well, our Charlie Fry lets me go below 100. So uh, this is how we do these experiments. Anyway, so as you go through, you see a double that you see two peaks here. This is the one with two HMPAs on it. So you have two of one kind of phenol uh, of and two of the other kind, and here they are. Then you go to three to one, then you go to the single again, which has four HMPAs. So it gets at least sequentially to solve it. Uh, anyway, uh, so no de-aggregation, but uh, simply sequential specification. So uh, we played with this uh, business. Uh, it's just a look at, uh, at how hard it is to pull a lithium off a carbon, OK, and uh, using HMPA. Here's kind of the graph that illustrates that. The ones at the top cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, ion separated. In other words, they, sometimes they don't even de-aggregate. Sometimes they go to monomer, but they stay monomer. And this includes many common lithium rays, satellites, aero lithiums, and so on. Uh, these more stabilized lithium reagents uh, can maybe require a very constant HMPA and uh, do this kind of this scale of how much wrong is the carbon that gives it the bond. Uh, you know, one can explore various effects here. You can see that chelation, if we compare two similar reagents, one of them is chelated, 